You know, during the month of August, we've been working through a sermon collection called Alignment. And for the last few weeks, I've been telling you a lot about my first car. Do you remember what it was? It was a white 98 Grand Am SE. Hallelujah. Low miles, cloth seats, and it had a cassette player so I could hook up my CD player. It was an amazing car, and I remember my dad and my mother, God rest their souls, bought it for me. Uh, when I was in college, and I was like, man, this is going to absolutely change the trajectory of my life. I'm going to be able to go places I haven't gone before, do some things that I wanted to do, but I haven't just yet because I never had a ride. But I remember my dad saying to me that before I could take this car on the road, I needed to get what's called an alignment. Yeah. And an alignment, as we discussed over the past few weeks, is the process of ensuring that the tires of a vehicle are all going in the same direction. And we said that if a tire is pulling in one direction or an another tire is pulling in a different direction, that it can cause the vehicle to get off course. And ultimately, it can cause some real harm to that particular vehicle. And as we said, the same thing that applies to cars and other vehicles on the road also applies to Accelerate Church. If we are not a church that's united around the vision, around the mission, around the core values of the church, what it will do is it will hinder us from reaching our destination, which is to reach the 6.2 million people in this area that we call Accelerate City, which is the Delaware Valley region. It's going to hinder us from being able to pour our efforts into Cherry Hill and Camden as the hub and saturating those areas so that it spills out into all the other regions. And so we as a church... We have to be aligned with each other, and we have to be aligned with the vision that God has given for the house. And so for the next two weeks, because we're coming to the end of this series, uh, we're going to take this car back into the shop today, this car called Accelerate Church, and we're going to ensure that we're aligned to the vision of the house and work through something called our core values. Amen? Okay. So uh, one thing you may not know about Sarah and I is that we are thrill seekers. We are thrill seekers. Uh, we love adventures. Uh, even though I'm more of an indoors man, Sour is more of an outdoors woman, we have done a lot of things that might surprise you. We've been whitewater rafting in class three rapids. I fell out a few times. I'm still alive. We've gone parasailing in the Caribbean, and we've both been skydiving. At 14,000 feet, we decided that it was a good idea to jump out of a plane. And I recently had an opportunity in Vermont to jump off of a bridge into the river below, but I was too scared, so I jumped at a lower height. <laughs> I hope to do it one day. You know, although thrill seekers like Sarah and I believe that bridges exist for our enjoyment, the truth is that bridges actually serve another function. They serve as a means of spanning chasms. They make it possible for you to get from one side to the other side when previously it wasn't available. And I would say that the same thing that applies to the physical structures called the bridge also applies to our churches. That our churches have to be the bridge that connect people to God and connect disconnected people to one another. And so today we'll be working through our third core value, and it's very simple. It's we build bridges. We build bridges. So what type of bridges or what type of chasms exist that we need to build a bridge to span? Number one, I would say that we need to build a bridge so that we can reach God's lost children. And we need to let them know that even though they may be lost, there is a family that they should be a part of called the local church. You know, one of my mentors, uh, whose son is on the spectrum, lost him in an in amusement park a few years back. And he said that it was one of the most scary events of his life. He was looking all around frantically to find his son. And then he stopped one of the security guards and he said, hey, my son is missing, my son is missing. And what he noticed is that the security guard had a very, very laissez-faire attitude. Eventually, he found his son, but he remembered that the security guard just put a haphazard effect or a haphazard type of effort into helping him find his son. 
And I can imagine that God feels the same way that my mentor does. That God has some missing children out there that he desperately wants to find. But the problem is, rather than us joining in the search party and frantically trying to find God's lost children, oftentimes we have the demeanor of the security guard. That we've gotten so used to lostness around us that it no longer causes us to have a sense of urgency. But friends, what I'm trying to tell you is that if we are going to be the church, that's the bridge, we have to get a sense of urgency, but we also have to let people know there's a family that exists called the church. And God wants you as his lost child to be a part of it. So not only do we need to connect God's lost children, but we also need to connect disconnected believers. You know, not only, uh, not only that, like, I can't, I can't tell you the amount of people that got disconnected during the pandemic. Can't tell you. Some of which, honestly, have never returned to the church. You know, before COVID, they said a consistent church member came to church, guess how many times? 1.7 times a month. That was pre-COVID. We're on the other side of COVID. I tried to find the number. I couldn't, but I can imagine... That is a lot lower than 1.7 times. And because there are people that are disconnected with the church, it's caused them in many ways to fall back into unhealthy and old sets of behaviors that they had deliverance from and had overcome a long time ago. You know, I heard one pastor say it like this. I hear people say all the time, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, to be a Christian. And they're absolutely right. Salvation is through faith alone and Christ alone. But you don't have to go home to be married either. But if you stay away long enough, your relationship will be affected. And that's what's happening with a lot of people's relationship with God right now. Slowly but surely, they trickled away from him. And then their lifestyle looks no different than the lifestyle of, of those who are living in a different way. What I'm saying is, friends, if we're going to be the church in God's heart that sees the 6.2 million people, You've heard that number a million times. I'm going to keep saying it. You're going to get it after the 25th time. 6.2 million people in the Delaware Valley region, an area that we call Accelerate Church. It means that we have to create a space for the disconnected Christian. It also means that we have to create a space for the hurting Christian. You know, I hope that this church becomes a bridge for those who've experienced church hurt. Church hurt is really, really prevalent in our society right now, is it not? And not every church hurts people, but there are a lot of churches that have hurt people. Some have been hurt because of their own mistakes. Some have been hurt because people have committed sins against them. Some have been hurt because of failed leadership. And the reality is, is once you experience church hurt, it's very, very difficult to re-engage. It's very, very difficult to be a part of a community again because you're afraid of being hurt again, and it makes you reassess and question the place of church in your life. I would say, if I'm honest, that a lot of what people deem as church hurt is not really church hurt. Some of it is, some of it isn't. Some of it is because we don't like how we got questioned or held accountable for our particular sins. And so we sometimes deem that as church hurt when it's not church hurt. It's a part of being in the family of Christ. But there are people that have been hurt by the church. And I'm not suggesting in any way that Accelerate Church is the perfect place. I actually think it's the perfect place for imperfect people. But I do believe that we have to be a bridge so that people who experience hurt in the past can heal from those old wounds. And so that they can walk in the newness. And so that they can identify, name, and experience health as they move forward in their relationship with Jesus. Well, you might be saying, well, Pastor, look, I hear you. Why are we building bridges? Well, we're building bridges because Jesus was the ultimate bridge builder. I want you to think about it for a second. The relationship between God the Father and us was deeply broken. And it was broken because of our iniquity, because of our pride, because of our ego. Because we kicked him off of the throne of our heart and tried to put ourselves on the throne. And because of that, there was a wide chasm. But Jesus decided in his mercy that on the cross of Calvary that he was going to pay for our abuses. 
that he was going to die for our sins. And what his body literally became on the cross of Calvary is the bridge to span the chasm between God the Father and his lost children. He was the bridge that that helped us get over the obstruction of iniquity, the obstruction of the old patterns of behavior. Friends, this is why Jesus died. He died so that we could stop treating God like an associate and start relating to him as a father. That's why on the cross of Calvary, when he said it is finished, if you notice, the veil in the temple was ripped in half. Before, in order for you to access God, you had to go through a system of intermediaries. You had to go through the priests, and you had to be ceremonially cleansed, and a myriad of other things. But in Jesus, he says, you now have unfettered access through the Father because of me. Because I was a bridge. And so what he's saying is, friends, if we're going to be the church after God's heart, we have to tear down walls of division, and we have to span chasms. What does that mean? It means that we've got to be a bridge between the racial hostility that exists in our world. We have to be the bridge between the LGBTQ community, even though we may have differing views on sexuality because they're made in the image of God and they're deeply loved and have a reverence for Jesus, many of them. God has called us to this end. That's why we serve in Cherry Hill and in Camden. Because in these two polar opposite contexts, we're believing that God is going to make us a bridge. And that through that bridge, it's going to spill over, you know the number. So the 6.2 million people in the Delaware Valley region, an area that we call what? We're going to nail that down before it's all said and done, aren't we? Y'all like, man, how many times have we said this? Until we all get it. Until we all get it. We want to be, bro, be blah, blah. We want to be bridge builders. But friends, let me say this. Before we can talk about building any bridges in the world, Before we can talk about spanning any chasms, you and I, all of us collectively, have to be united. It means that we need to be a church united in a world that's divided. Friends, one of the reasons that we're walking into this series is because because of our distinctions and our differences and our opinions and our families of origin, we all can get very, very divided. Think about this. I love the diversity of our church. I love it. I talk about it regularly. I love it. We, I mean, we have baby boomers and Gen X. We have Presbyterians and Pentecostals. We have the economically advantaged and the disadvantaged. We have black, Latino, Latinx, white, and everything in between. We're a little light in the Asian community, but we're working on it. What I would say is that this is a beautiful, beautiful picture of what heaven can look like. But if we are not careful... The beauty of this group can be marred by the ugliness of division. So here's what I want to do today. I want to just give us some steps on how we can be a church united. And I want to work through this passage in 1 Corinthians and ultimately show how we can be bridge builders. I'm going to learn how to say that at some point. You know, let me tell you a little bit about this church in the verse that we read. The name of this place that Paul, the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament, is writing to is a church in Corinth. Corinth is a church at the time of this writing that was about the same age as our church today. If you want to read more about this story, you can actually find out or read more about it in Acts 18. Corinth was a modern and -and up-and-coming city in the Roman Empire. It was a beautiful port city. It uh, it, It boasted itself to be an economic powerhouse a vacation destination, and it really attracted young, upwardly mobile people all around the Roman Empire. It was a cosmopolitan region full of young, rich, and diverse people that boasted scores of temples that had busts of the Greek and Roman gods. The architecture was terrific, and Paul lived in this city for a year and a half, and he led many of those people in this city to Jesus. And he loved them so much, but you know how it goes when daddy's away, the children will play. (laughs) So Paul leaves and goes and starts another church, and then he starts getting some reports that things are getting a little weird in the church. There was some snitching going on from (laughs) Chloe's people. I love it. Shout out to the snitches. That was just letting you know that, hey, it's something 
brewing in here that seems very, very toxic. Pastor J.D. Greer says there was a lot of different things going on. He identifies at least five. Number one, there was a lot of divisions. There was a lot of factions and cliques and a myriad of other things that we'll talk about today. Sexual, sex, secondly, there was division over sexual ethics. There were a lot of young, attractive people in the church, and there was a lot of sexual sin that was happening. Thirdly, there was division over Christian liberties, because people were wondering, hey, what's permissible for a Christ follower to do? They were specifically asking questions like, hey, can I eat food and drink drinks that have been offered to idols. Now, I know that doesn't really matter as much to us today, but it was a relevant issue back then. And fourthly, there was a lot of division, you won't believe this, over church services. There were people who would stand up in the middle of the service and say, hey, God's put something in my heart that I need to say. And sadly, if the leaders did not recognize them, then they were being accused of quenching the spirit. People were speaking in tongues, and they were doing that all at the same time. And Paul is like, Jesus, you got to have an interpreter. If it's a known language, then you need to be able to interpret it. But if they don't exist, then they need to be silent in the church. Why? Because I'd rather you speak a few words that you understand than a thousand that you don't understand. You do it for edification, which is beautiful, but unless there's an interpreter there, who can tell the congregation what you're saying, then it's only edifying you. And even though that's beautiful, that doesn't help the body. So that's why he says, I'd rather all prophesied, not just foretelling, but forthtelling, meaning that you can take the tenets of the scripture and you can expound upon them. Paul is like, what's happening in this church? And on top of that, there's a lot of theological issues. Some are saying, well, you know, we don't really need the resurrection of Jesus. That's why Paul takes all of 1 Corinthians 15 and lets us know that the gospel is of first importance. And then he said on the third day, Jesus rose and he appeared to all of these disciples to let them know that this was a physical bodily resurrection. And that eventually after the resurrection, he's going to come back with a resurrection melody. And those who are on earth are going to be called up to meet with him in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. He's saying, there's a lot of division that's going on in this church. There's division over theology. There's division over worship styles. There's division over Christian liberty and a myriad of other things. There's a a division over singleness versus marriage. There's a lot happening. And some of you are like, whoo, pastor, this church is jacked up. Whoo, they're messed up. I see why why Paul had to write so many letters to them. I see why they needed two letters and all these chapters. But let me just say, Any church that's committed to reaching unreached people are going to have these problems. Did you hear what I said? They're going to have these problems. In the words of of one expositor, when lost sheep come through the door, they still smell like sheep. And sometimes, get this, the sheep poop on the floor. Right? And let me just tell you, I love it. I'm going to tell you why. Now, I don't love the sin, but I, I, I love it when it happens. I love when we come into church and they don't know any of the songs. I love it. I love it when I hear that uh, somebody that's new to the church commandeered a crew. I love to hear it when I heard that there was a fight on a worship team I, I, or a, a fight on this team. I love it. You know why? Because it means we're reaching the people that God has sent us to reach. It means that we are actually accomplishing the issue that's at hand. We are actually addressing and reaching people that are far from Jesus. That means, you know what what Tim Keller calls that? Living church problems. Living church problems. You know what the alternative is? Dying church problems. Where everybody looks the same. And everybody votes the same. And it's the same messages, and it's the same sermons, and, it's the, and it's, everybody looks uniform. Now, I, we don't want that. We want the diversity of the body of Christ. It means that we're actually doing the work that God has asked us to do. And church, let me just say, if we are going to reach <laughs> the 6.2 million people, that are in the Delaware Valley region, a region we call, then we've got to be aligned to the vision and mission. Here's what I want to say. Because I don't want us to be the type of church that complains that we stepped in the sheep's poop. Uh, did you hear how they talked to me? Did you, 
Did you see? Do you see what they have on? And? And? I'm happy they're in the building. They haven't been in church three years. Since, they, since their mom got hurt. This is a different experience for them. Give them some time and some grace to acclimate into this new environment. We need to be the church that doesn't complain about stepping in poop. But we need to be the church that is thankful that we have a dustpan called grace that we can just sweep it in and mop the floor. So let's talk about this for a second. Let's talk about being united. Let's talk about this. In verse 10, Paul begins, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters. There's actually been a ton of ink spilled on this word urge. Some have said it means petition or admonition, but Paul is saying that, hey, this thing is very important. I urge you, brothers and sisters, he's using familial language, and then normally he leans into the authority of his apostleship. He says, based upon the fact that I've seen Jesus, I command you. But here, this is so serious that he actually calls on the name of God. He says, I'm going to bring Jesus in this situation. It's like when you see NGL online, not going to lie. That's what's happening here. Paul is like, I'm not going to lie. I need the Lord in this situation because y'all acting really weird. Then he says, let there not be any division among you. Someone say division. Division. What does he mean by division? He means division factions. He means tribalism. He means that in the church, there is a, in this church, there was like a JV team and there was a varsity team. And he heard from Chloe's people that there was some bickering going on and some arguing going on because, which I'll tell you about in a second. Like, and let me just tell you, nothing will quite destabilize a church like a church that, are, that is fracturing over secondary and tertiary issues. It will fracture a church. You might ask, well, what type of division was going on? I told you earlier, and some of it was theological. Some believe that they needed to hold on to the Old Testament law, so they believe Christ alone plus cultural adherence equals salvation. So you had to get circumcised or you had to follow the law. And Paul was like, no, no, no. It's only through faith in Christ alone that you are saved. It's only through Jesus because the law didn't die for you. Um, The commandments didn't go to the cross for you. It was only that broken up Aramaic speaking lamb named Jesus that went went and did it. So he's saying, no, you don't need to do that. But on top of that, there's division over personalities. Look what he says in verse 11 and 12. He says, some are saying, I belong to Christ. Others are saying, I belong to Opolis. Some are saying, well, I'm part of Cephas or Peter's regime. And some are saying, no, no, I don't follow any of them. I just need Jesus and my Bible. I'm following Jesus. So what's happened is they've created schisms, get this, around personalities. Some are like, well, I'm part of Opolis' crew because I'm cultured. I'm educated. Opolis was this sophisticated speaker that was educated in the University of Alexandria. He was a great speaker, and and people were drawn to him because he could communicate so well. Some were like, no, 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 I love Paul because he is a theological piece. Have you ever read Romans? (laughs) And some were like, nah, Paul's okay, he's great, but he can't really preach like that. That's why at one of the meetings, some dude fell out of a window and, and died because he was so boring. Paul had to raise him up. Paul even said himself, my bodily appearance is weak, but my words are mighty. 2 Corinthians 10.10, he says that, right? I believe. Don't check me on that. I'm I'm pretty sure that's the verse. And then some were like, nah, I'm part of Peter's crew because Peter is still a Jew, or he's trying to act like one. So um, I believe in his Jewish sensibilities. Somebody's like, no, 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 I follow Jesus. I just need Jesus in the Bible. I'm the Jesus Jew guy. And Paul is like, I am disgusted by it all. And church, let me just tell you, you are going to be attracted to certain leaders more than other leaders in Christ's church. It makes sense because you work with them on a regular basis. You serve in their ministries. You might like their disposition and things like that. It's nothing wrong with that. But when your preference of a leader starts causing a spirit of division, and it undermines the authority of the other leader, then you've overstepped your bounds. 
you've overstepped it. It's like, you know how this plays out in church? Oh, I like Pastor Earn. Ooh. But have you ever heard Lady Sarah? Ooh, I can't wait to hear her preach. She's the real powerhouse. She's the one. Well, you're right. She's the great leader. Oh, oh, I, listen, I love Sarah, but have you ever been on Pastor Jacob's team? Don't start, Miss Adrian. <laughs> I love that Pastor Jacob. And the truth be told, he preaches better than Pastor Ern. I like his messages better. I don't really get worried about that. You know why? Because I help teach him how to preach. <laughs> he should be better. He should be better. Right? You got all this going on. You got all this on. But let me ask you, Accelerate Church, are we divided? Yeah. Talk, We're all pulling in the same direction. Let me just tell you, because some of us don't know when we're being divisive. Let me help you. You know that you're being divisive when you start having those little private meetings. You know those private meetings where you begin to talk about the things that happened in the real meeting, and then you have the side conversation. You know what I'm talking about, right? After the meeting is over, where you talk to the few members of the team and say things that you wouldn't say to the actual leader. Paul said in this same chapter or the same book, he said, I heard that some people were talking reckless like that. And then in Ernest Grant translation, I want them to keep the same energy when I see them in public, right? But, but when you're divisive and when you have those secret meetings, it actually comes with a family of other behaviors. Gossip, slander, criticism, judgmentalism. Friends, divisiveness is the antithesis of unity. And somebody might be saying, well, you know, I don't, how do I know that I'm being divisive? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> because we're going to take a quiz real quick. Because Henry, Dr. Henry Brand gives us some questions so that we can evaluate whether we're divisive or not. So why don't you score yourself in your mind from one to five, one being the lowest, five being the highest. Here's the first one. How often do you argue and quarrel with others? And do you raise your voice? Do you tell stories about others that they would prefer not be spread around? Do you ever make up or exaggerate stories to put people in a bad light? Is it more important that you get people on your side than it is help? Uh, uh, is it more important that you get people on your side than it is to help reach an agreement within the group that you're a part of? Do you delight? pointing at other people's faults? Do you condemn the piety of morality of others? Do you have a reputation as someone who is hard to get along with? I knew I wasn't going to get a bunch of amens on that. But it's important. Like, we have to ask ourselves, are we divisive? Because in many ways, we all can be. But friends, if we are going to reach the people far from God, and they come through these doors at Welcome Home Sunday, and it's packed in here, both services, Right? And, and, and God is moving. Are they going to find a church united or are they going to find a church divided? Are they going to be find a church that's divided firstly around the gospel, the belief that Jesus is central in all things? And secondly, our core values and our, our, our vision and our mission, are they going to find that our minds are in line? Are we saying the same thing about that? Or will they find us divided? Because unity is so important. Well, let me just tell you, I was talking about unity and bridge building. Let me tell you what unity is not. Is that fair enough? Does it mean that we're going to start agreeing over everything? I hope not. I hope we don't. That is, that's not always. That's, that's sometimes when you agree everything, over everything, it's called false peace. And we don't want to settle for a false peace. That's why in your groups and when you're leading people, you want to hear some honest feedback. You don't want to cross the line to disrespect, but you want to have some awesome feedback so that you can get, or, or so that the best solution can actually win. That's important at times. But one thing we need to be agreed on is that the gospel is primary. And that what's central is reaching people far from God and edifying the people here. We need to have the same conviction about that, and we have to have the same conviction that everything else is secondary. And so this unity, when we have a spirit of divisiveness, however, what it does is it undermines the unity that Christ wants us to have. So, so let me give you a few examples on what unity is not. Number one, unity is not 
uniformity. We don't want to be a cookie cutter church. We don't want to be a church where everybody votes the same and everybody looks the same and everybody sounds the same. We don't want churches like that. Listen, friends, a football team is united, but not everybody plays the same position. And regardless of the position that they play, they're all still immensely important. Right? Like, like when you're on a football team, everybody's doing different things. In an orchestra, I've never been to the orchestra. But one thing I know is that not everybody is singing the same parts. You need harmony in unity. Here's the second thing. It's not relativism. It's not anything goes. It's not do what you want. It's, it's we all have the same convictions that the centrality of the gospel is important. And friends, I'm, I'm finishing up here because I've preached far too long. But Jesus didn't die so that we could be a divided church. He didn't die for that. 2,000 years ago, his body was torn on the cross of, Kevin, or cross of Calvary so that we can be united with the Father. And this is important that we have unity. Let me give you some, practice, some practical steps. Give you some practical steps on how we can pursue unity and build bridges as a church. Number one, we need to practice gentleness. A lot of us think that gentleness is weakness. We think that when we're kind, we're actually being weak. But let me just tell you, you're not. Gentleness is strength under control. It's the horse with the bridle in his mouth that could oust the rider off of his back, but chooses not to. I just want to encourage us that we have to be cognizant, that we're not bullying and domineering to people. Another thing is we got to be patient with each other. Got to be patient with, each other, with each other, patient with each other's shortcomings, patient with each other's faults, patient with each other's weaknesses. You know why? Because Jesus has been patient with you. It doesn't mean that we tolerate everything, but it means that we don't castigate and hurt and harm other people. Here's the last one. We need to zealously pursue unity. It means that you and I, when we hear speech or gossip, that we don't engage in it. When we hear slander, we don't take part in it. It means that we are bought in so much so to us having unity in this church that when we see something that's antithetical to it, we push back against it. And I just believe, friends, that when you and I are united, we will be nothing more like Jesus during this season. Because I don't know if you know, but we're trying to reach 6.2 million people. I think it's like 1.7, 1.17, but you know, that's 6.2 million people in the Delaware Valley region, a place we call Accelerate Church. And so, friends, I'm finished, but I just want to give you the opportunity at this time. If you want to take your next step in your Christian faith. For some of us, maybe you need to accept Jesus for the first time. Let me say, if that's you, welcome home. We're so happy that you're here. I'm so grateful for your presence, and we believe that God is moving and working in your life, and we would love to celebrate that with you. Why don't you grab the Connect card and just in, fill it out and give us the step that indicates your next step. Maybe you need to join a crew in the fall. We've got 19 crews that are launching, at least, right Right that 19 launcher that space for you to be connected for your family to be connected it's going to be an amazing time maybe you need to go through our open house which happens right after the end of this service right where that sign says open house where you can learn a little bit more about the vision and mission of church and, and be a part of us maybe you need to join the dream team whatever it is we want to help you take your next step maybe some of you just need to sit for a season to heal from a past pain that you experienced well, you're welcome to do that as well. But there's going to come a point where God's going to push you off the sideline and push you into the game because he wants to see you accelerate into a relationship with him. Why don't you let me pray for you? Father, I thank you so much that because of the unity you had with the Father and the Son and the Spirit, that we're able to be a united church. Lord, I pray for all of those under the sound of my voice. Lord, may we be, in the words of Big Mama from Soul Food, that fist, that hand, those fingers that come together 
and form a mighty fist so that we can push back the darkness in this region and so that we can share the fame and the renown of Jesus all throughout this area. Lord, we thank you for you are good and you are merciful and you are kind. Thank you for being patient with us. Help us to pursue patience. Help us to pursue zealously contending for unity. And help us to practice gentleness. Because you were gentle with us. Help us to be gentle with other people. And so, Lord, we thank you. We honor you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Everybody agree with that? Say amen. Amen. Can you put your hands together for Jesus in this place?